Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and prepare to get enlightened with money. Today, we're talking about how to develop a Zen approach to your money with financial educator Michael Gilmore. For our TikTok Minute, we'll learn how strip clubs are the number one economic indicator. I knew it! Which is why I've been investing in them for years. In our headlines, over $6 trillion is sitting in cash, and that's just what's under Joe's mom's mattress. What? No? Well, it's got to be lumpy for some reason. What's all this money doing, and why isn't it in stocks? We'll share. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Stacker Tracy, who wants to know more about Roth 401ks. And then, just because I'm a super nice guy, I'll share some pretty powerful trivia for you, at no extra charge. And now, two guys who know how to become one with money, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. It's time to get zen today, stackers. I can't wait, and uh, we got the most zen man of them all across the card table from me. Mr. Mr. OG, I bet you were Zen when your son uh, put the car through the wall. I laughed, actually. Yeah, I was <laughs> surprisingly calm. Yep. Said the man with great insurance. <laughs> Had to. Not so Said calm the after the insurance renewed, and they went, about that claim. Oh, yeah, that thing. We are talking Zen and money, and I do think, OG, people need to figure out how to be a little more zen it tends to make us uptight so if we can help people not be so uptight with money that's our goal today and we've got a bunch more going on so i think we should just get into it don't you think we should just get it let's just get into it dive in as they say just i say we do it we've got michael gilmore here but first a headline so let's go hello darlings And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our headline today comes to us from MarketWatch, written by Joy Wildermuth. Why this $6 trillion pile of cash isn't heading for stocks anytime soon? Oh, gee, $6 trillion. That's that's a big number. Joy writes, there are trillions of dollars parked in money market funds and other cash-like investments collecting about a 5% return. Probably don't count on it being deployed elsewhere soon money market funds hit a record 5.9 trillion in assets as of last tuesday signaling a continuing drain out of bank deposits into higher yielding cash-like investments according to peter crane president publisher of crane data he expects the tally soon to eclipse six trillion and then to stay elevated even though money market assets already grew about 18 percent in may from a year ago here's my question og Stock market's up, what, roughly 20% off the lows. That is the textbook definition of a bull market. So if we're back in bull market territory, why we got so much money sitting in cash? I think it's because all we're hearing in the media is telling us to be afeard of this giant recession that's coming. Well, I think that the, you know, the biggest reason, you know, kind of, uh, dovetail to you know what Doug said there about the recession, uh, uh, or, or, or being afraid of the recession, is is that um, uh, people do the opposite things that they're supposed to do when it comes to investing on the on the whole. You know, we obviously highlight all of the good stories. You know, of rebalancing and using your disciplined approach of investing throughout. Uh, Good times and bad. We highlight all of those good stories, but in aggregate, we can see what really happens. What really happens is that the average investor takes all of their money and puts it in cash and then waits for the market to go really high again and then goes, yeah, I should YOLO back in. And uh, that's and that's a recipe for disaster. But that's what's happened since the beginning of time. So it's not a surprise. Your sentiment is echoed by Michael Rosen, co-founder and chief investment officer of Angela's Investments, which advises endowments, foundations and private pension funds. He says a lot of it's on the sidelines and sustained bearishness about stocks could be a signal to move into stocks. And what's interesting about that, OG, is that we 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 are definitely not about market timing. You're always going to lose that game. But I'm wondering 
if you did research around investing into the places where outflows are going out the most and then going the opposite way into places where where tons of money's going in so as an example a lot of money going into cash right now taking money out of cash putting money in stocks if we did if we made that move i wonder i i don't know that i've seen that data but i would imagine it's got to be pretty good cuz i always feel like when we see huge inflows into stocks seems like the biggest inflows that we always report on are, are at times when uh, when it's just about to get ugly. Well, the problem with it is that you don't know when the top is going to happen, right? I mean, if you remember back in the late 90s, Alan Greenspan's irrational exuberance comment happened a solid three and a half years before the market peaked. So you you were right if you were like this, this this you know this seems overvalued or statistically it is that didn't make you right from an investing standpoint which is why it's hard to do this either way you know either to 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 be tactically smart on the inverse you know be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy the Warren Buffett quote um, or to just look at metrics like this I'll give you another great example of this since uh, the middle of October which is kind of sort of the bottom of of the of the pullback last year um the tech stocks you know nasdaq's up 27 percent. small companies are up eight and your regular run-of-the-mill big companies are up 13 and so that to me i see this wide range and we know historically that small companies do better than big companies over time and so if we were tactical we might look and say well eight versus 27 small companies against the biggest tech companies in the universe. This is backwards. That's not how it should be historically. But does that mean we should take all of our money out of tech stocks, all of our money out of the big companies and dump them in small? Probably not, because there's no way to know how long this uh, disparity is going to last. And um, what's what's the uh, what's the phrase? The market will remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. So you can be right but you might not be right at the right time and you could still lose your butt. So just follow the plan. I love how, I love how forthright our Friday contributor Len Penzo has been about sharing his agony OG in that area, as you know, but new listeners may not know. Len has been very, very open about the fact that he tried to call the top several times and he swung and missed. And, and to his credit, he tells his readers like, you shouldn't do that because of the fact that you're playing with you're playing with fire and he missed out on some big returns just before he retired. Well, and I, I would tell Lynn, Lynn this and I'm sure that we've we've talked about it, um, but this was a conversation I had with somebody the other day. They're getting close to retirement. They're a couple of years away. And he says, I'm really concerned about a market, a big, significant market pullback. You know, I had, I said, you mean in addition to the one that we just had a year ago? He says, yeah, well, that one I felt like, you know, I could withstand. But if we had another 2008, as I'm getting close to retirement, I'm really concerned about that. And as we, if you kind of unpack that a little bit, what are you really worried about? You're not worried about the market. If you believe in the, in, in the, in the efficacy of owning companies over the long run, like if that's kind of your base, you know, thesis, what you're concerned with is taking money out. If the market's gone down, that's the only thing you really are concerned with. You're not concerned about the ups and downs because history has proven time and time again, that it will go down temporarily, but eventually goes back up again. Right? So you just need to give it time. The biggest issue is having to take money out and have it go down at the same time. So if you can solve that problem, which we do with, you know, having make sure making sure that you have enough emergency fund and cash reserve and kind of that war chest, the 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 if you can solve that problem, then you can be invested with the rest of the time. And we would tell Len and we have told him, you know, if we if we kind of unraveled what he was really concerned with, which was, hey, I want to retire, but I also don't want to withstand a market decline because I don't want to take money out during a market decline, I think, I think you would have chosen a different path. Well, and I think what you stated right there, OG is the reason why dollar cost averaging is important. It's not because it's a winning strategy, but it's a not betting strategy. Dollar cost averaging works because everything else doesn't or isn't. Let me put that a different way. It might work, 
The dollar cost averaging works every time. Just keep buying. Buy it when it's high, buy it when it's low, buy it what's in the middle. Start off with whatever investment type you need to be in for the goal and dollar cost average into it. Which means for people new to dollar cost average averaging, you're just buying as you go. You're buying all along. 60% of the time, it works every time. <laughs> exactly. I don't think that's the stat here. I don't, I don't, don't think that one applies here. But I like that. I think people spend a lot of time, OG, worrying about when to buy, when not to buy. When should I put money into, into money market? Well, this when is really I put simple. Into yeah, let me let me let me let me summarize it. Let me let me tell you the exact answer here. You should invest when you have the money, and you should withdraw the money when you need the money. Boom. There it is. I believe wow, they call that a killed, mic drop. I think we just killed CNBC's like twenty three of the twenty four hours they do a day. <laughs> with, Shoot, with, more than that. <laughs> with that one line. Uh, we will dive further into that uh, in our newsletter, the 201, tomorrow. If you're wondering how dollar cost averaging works, if you're wondering exactly uh, what these very straightforward investment strategies are that OG and I are talking about, stackingbenjamins.com slash 201 signs you up for our free newsletter. Time for our TikTok Minute. This is the part of the show where we share some information Sometimes submitted by our stacker audience today. Liz sent this to me, OG. Did Liz pick out something hilarious or something useful today? Did we have we changed the terms of the TikTok minute? Usually the question is, is it brilliant or is it is it air quotes brilliant or hashtag brilliant or whatever? But so you threw OG off because you asked him a different question and he doesn't know. Which one to go with? Because he's always going to crap all over it. He was going to always crap over that question, Doug, which is why I changed the question. Because A, it's not one that I picked. It's one that Liz picked. Of course it's brilliant. Duh. A stacker picked it. Of course it's brilliant. Okay. But is it hilarious or is it useful? I'm going to go hilarious. In the eye you know of the what? Let's, uh, let's take a listen. This is an Instagram reel. Fun fact, on May 19th, 2022, exotic dancer Botticelli Bimbo posted this tweet, stating that economists were wrong and we had already entered into a recession. It was added onto by Agave Baby, reiterating that economists were far behind the curve on the incoming financial crisis. This tweet went viral and was dubbed the stripper index. As an economic indicator, it tells you how people feel about the economy and their bank accounts. As times get tougher and money is tighter, people will begin cutting back on spending, and the strip club is one of the first places people choose to save money. Botticelli went on to tweet that strip clubs are not just places of simple entertainment. They're an operative tool for business people. The worst salesmen bring their clients and where recruiters bring prospective finance bros. She claims December makes up a large part of strip club revenues because that's when finance employees get their year-end bonuses. She says strippers are better trend forecasters than any finance bro because strippers need to be aware of how upper-class white men are spending their money. Another user added on to the tweet sharing a story of a stripper who had advised him to sell his stocks in early 2007 since the club had been dead for way too long and then buy them back after the market had crashed. She sold her stocks, bought them back after the 2008 crash, and nearly doubled her money. That is... I love the... I love the the uh, the big fallacy in that. There was this one stripper this one time who in 2007 said, sell your stocks, and she was right. And then she said, buy them back. So she was right again. So this is this is the reason why you probably probably should do that. So hashtag brilliant, basically. There it is. I think... I think there may be, there may be, OG, the way that people spend money. I mean, discretionary spending. I never thought of it as a stripper index. I did have a couple clients, OG, that were, um, that are, were veterinarians that would say that they could feel a recession coming on when Fido no longer came to the vet and did make the usual appointments. Like Fido is a member of the family, except when the economy goes down and then, Fido's the first one voted out of the family, apparently. Uh, I think we're going to choose not to spend money on that. So I always thought of it as the veterinarian index, not the stripper index, but maybe more of the same. Uh, Yeah, probably same, same, right? Do you think that uh, strippers have a leg up on the economy? Do you think that you didn't you didn't hear it, did you? I did hear it. Yes. Yes. Oh, I can't hear it. I just tried not to. Oh, oh, 
if you just do it louder, maybe it'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's because I got, I got, I got, I got, because I got AirPods in. I got it. I feel like there's about 15 more puns there that we can make, and I'm not coming up with them. But I should have, should have rehearsed those. Uh, thanks, Liz, for that. The, uh, for the stripper index. Uh, OG, have you seen anything like that before? Strippers, veterinarians, any of those I'm things that are telltale any signs? Of those, any of those places. Yes, I. You're not allowed to visit veterinarians or any of those things. I, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Just to be safe. Have have absolutely no, absolutely no idea. Coming up, coming up next, Michael Michael Gilmore is a guy who who wrote one of those little books. You know the little books OG that Wiley puts out. The little book of this. The little book of that. They didn't have the little book of Zen money, and Michael Gilmore is the perfect person to write it. He's worked in finance for over two decades, served as research director at Albizia Capital, independent boutique fund management company. It was only, though, when he was teaching his daughter basic money concepts that he realized that this is something that isn't being taught properly around the world. He created... Uh, some awards which are highly sought after in the fintech community called the Money Awareness Inclusion Awards. We'll have more on that on Wednesday because we have one of the award winners joining us on on that day. But today, Michael Gilmore going to talk to us about Zen and money. I think it's an important discussion because too often are we not relaxed about money. Money makes people pretty uptight. So learning how to be Zen with our money all Buddha like uh, OG is right now is, uh, would be super. Those not watching the video might want to go get the YouTube of that one. Uh, but Doug, let's have them YouTube you doing trivia. How about that? Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and Zen is the place to be. Zen to me is relaxing and letting your intuition lead you to the best barbecue. And you know what? I'm great at it. My stomach hasn't failed me yet. Or maybe it's my nose. Either way, I'm telling you, I'm practically a Zen master. I can blank my mind on command. I can make that own noise. And Joe's mom yells that I've apparently mastered the art of tuning people out. Speaking of Zen, thousands of books have been written about the practice, but perhaps none more famous than Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, which leads us to today's trivia question. What is the number one motorcycle manufacturer on earth? I'll be back right after I find out where my intuition is leading me for today's lunch. Hey there, stackers. I'm back porch enlightener and lunch navigator, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. We're quietly contemplating which motorcycle manufacturer is the largest in the world. I'm something of a Zen motorcycle mechanic myself. Well, now it's Zen, but back in my wilder days, I ran with a pretty tough Vespa gang called the Flamingos. We terrorized sidewalk cafes and farmer's markets by revving those massive, super loud two-stroke engines those Vespas have. And while admittedly Vespas may cater to a smaller crowd, here's today's trivia question. Which company founded in 1959 became the largest motorcycle manufacturer on the planet? The answer is Honda. And now it's time to rev up and tune in to your money intuition with our guy talking Zen and money, Michael Gilmore. And I'm super happy he's having a seat at the card table with us. Michael Gilmore's here. How are you, man? Very good. Very glad to be here. Thanks very much. I uh, I have to address the elephant in the room immediately in, in your latest project, uh, all about Zen and money. It does not say Michael Gilmore. It says the $7 millionaire. So everybody's going to ask me this. So we might as well start there. How did you get the moniker, the $7 millionaire? Yeah, it was actually, it was the book before this. I was working, I was working with migrant workers and I was trying to teach them about money because these people, there's like, there's probably 150 to 200 million migrant workers in the world and they all leave their homes and they leave their families behind because they want to make more money. And a lot of time there's studies showing that maybe only 5% 
get the money that they want to do. So I was working with migrant workers. And at the time, my daughter was, my older daughter was 17 years old. And I realized I wasn't teaching her the things I was teaching to migrant workers. And nor was school, nor was anybody. And I had like one year before she left college. So I thought, what am I going to do? I, I, I can't just give her a lecture every weekend because that's going to ruin maybe our last year together. So I thought, I'll write her a book. I'll write her a fun book about money. So we worked on lots and lots of different things. And one of the things we looked at was how money compounds. And she's like, okay, but what about a million dollars? How, what's this? She asked me this very specific question. What's the smallest amount of money I would need to save every day to become a millionaire by the time I re retire? And I said, well, okay, throw a few assumptions in, pull out a spreadsheet, put the numbers, $7. If you start saving $7 a day when you're 20 and you invest it and you get 7% returns, by the time you're 70, that'll be a million dollars. And I was like, it's such a small amount of money per day. Right. I had to right, back yeah. check it, recheck it, play with the numbers again. And she just looked at me, but I saw a l yeah. And I, I saw a light go on in her eyes. It's like seven dollars. I think she thought I mean she was seventeen, so when I say all her life it wasn't very long, but she thought she's never gonna be a millionaire. It's out of her reach. And then she heard seven dollars and said, Oh no, I can do that. That's a number I can do. And I was like, done. That was the whole book in that one sentence. It's like she got it, that she knew she could do it. And she knew it. then she's like, okay, how do I do it? How do I do it? How do I do it? That was it. So I thought, yeah, Michael Gilmore, it says who I am, but it doesn't say as much as $7 millionaire. If you can learn that you can be a millionaire $7 at a time, then the book's done, right? You've got that whole message right there. And so that's why I keep that name. And yeah, it's better than my name. <laughs> I I don't know about that. Michael Gilmore is a pretty good name. However, I do like that it lowers the temperature, which is really this project is all about Zen and money. Where is the intersection? Because as you know, Michael, people think hives and money or fear and money or trepidation and money. We think all these other things, but Zen and money isn't something you hear together very often. No, it's not. And it's actually, this was the, that was my main motivation for writing it. Exactly as you said, lower the temperature. Um, because I'd written a book for my daughter. So I wrote that book and I wrote, I literally just wrote it for her. And then I was very lucky a publisher heard about it and wanted to publish it. Uh, and I, they, they, they did a lot of kind of detailed asking me questions of who's the target market. And I described my daughter in exact detail and said, that's a very accurate market description. I was like, yeah, because it's my daughter. It's a market of one. Uh, it's like just her, not even her sister. This is just for her. Um, Wiley's and then thinking, they would by do the way, Wiley Michaels, think about while you're saying that, we might want to sell at least two of these. Maybe two, maybe three. <laughs> okay, okay, maybe. So that, that, so they're like, okay, that that's good. But who's so? Then they'll do another one. I was like, well, if if I had like the smallest target market with my first one, who do I want to talk to in the second one? I don't, you know, the younger one doesn't need it. She's kind of go ahead, screwed on already. Um, and I want to talk to people who feel stressed about money because that's the biggest group. That's everyone. I mean, that's like if you look at. And the latest data shows like something like 50% of all people in the U.S. cite money as their number one concern. And that includes people that earn over $100,000 a year. You know, it's like that's telling you it's not about the money. It's about the stress. And now one thing we all know is you can't say to a stressed person, don't be stressed. It's like telling your wife to you know calm down. It never works, right? It's like the golden rule when you get married, right? Don't ever say that. The, um, it, it, you can't tell people to unstress. You've got to ask them to look for something else. And, you got, and th that was the appeal, like Zen. I, now, that was one of the starting points, was that idea. But there were lots of others as I worked on it. This sort of realization that, you know, less is more, that it's at the heart of Zen. You know, that, that is, you, you aren't just happy because you spend all your money. And, you know, the number of people that will say to you, I don't want to save money because I want to enjoy myself now. And you say, so enjoyment equals spending. Money equals enjoyment. Really? Is that what you think? Because I guarantee you it doesn't. And so we worked on lots and lots of, so the book has got lots of exercise working around that concept. But there's, there's other things as well in there as well. One of my favorite bits of it is that, you know, Zen is one of the few philosophies that actually has like a, a math, math for, for, for happiness, for nirvana. And it is that, you know, it's if you if you want 
if sorry, if you get more than you want, you're you know you're you're happy supposedly. That's like that's what we all believe in the West, in the West. But actually, if you do that sum, you can change how much you want, right? You can change the 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 the, 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 the denominator, change a bit underneath. Now, what the beauty of that is, we all know, we all learn in basic math class. If you divide anything by zero, you get infinite. Right, so this is where the, the Zen comes in. Is like, if you doesn't matter what you get, if you want nothing, if you really strive for it, you'll be very happy. And we turn that into all kinds of different practical ideas of, of how we drive down our spending, how we drive down our wants, and how we look at the world in a different way. And that's the goal with this, and that can make us happier. I want to pause for a second on those equations because I found both of those very, very. Um interesting in the simplicity of them which is of course zen right we take these things mm -hmm. that sometimes and you talk about the difference between complicated and complex and we use those terms so often interchangeably but this idea that get over want that that the that that the happiness equation if we if we have get on the top want on the bottom then we want very little. The infinite happiness equation that you just walked through, that we infinitely, it feels very, this math, Michael, feels very much like minimalism. You know, I mean, it, are, are Zen and minimalism uh, related to each other, do you think? I think they are. I mean, minimalism is really, you know, it's just a, the modern term for it. I think the, the difference I'd say with, with Zen is obviously like real Zen, and I can't pretend to understand real Zen. You know, I haven't shaved my head. I don't live in a temple. Um, you know, the real Zen really does go on. I mean, there's a, there's a Zen Cohen which says, you know, if you meet a Buddha on the, on the street, murder him because he's fake. Uh, and so are you. You can't. It's impossible. And that's the beauty of this maths, right? The thing we have to do is you th the maths is simple, but th there's like the difference between complicated and complex, right? There's also a difference between simple and easy. That math is simple. It's the opposite of easy. It's just it's actually impossible. Now, knowing it's impossible doesn't mean we shouldn't move towards that direction because happiness is that way. Right. That's the path towards happiness. And that's what we that's what the kind of structure of the whole book is about is. This is a path. This is a path we walk down and we learn these. We can learn the big milestones. We can learn the big landmarks. But then we take little steps to get there. And each of those steps will take us a little bit further towards it. But, yeah, I think it's a, that that simple mass to me says we're on the right track. We really know we're on the right track. Whereas, you know, you're on the wrong track when you see every big celebrity and every famous person, every sports person that earns tens and hundreds of millions of dollars blow through it all and have all kinds of addiction problems because they're not happy and they can't keep their money. The right path is the one that leads towards that, towards the other, towards zero, towards, you know, get over want. I want to ask you, there's a story that you tell that I actually, I have actually participated in this uh, ritual that happens. I believe it's every day. You will know better than me, Michael. It's, it's in, uh, uh, Luang Prabang, Lu Luang Prabang. I've been there and I can't pronounce yeah. the name of that town. <laughs> yeah. But you described the monks and I actually yeah. woke up very early one morning. I, I had a bowl of sticky rice and the monks yeah. proceeded by me. Can you tell everyone the story of the monks and why do, what do the monks have to do with us and being Zen about money? Yeah, I no, it's great. I'm glad you've been there. Um, we might have to talk longer about that another time. Um, but, but the whole point to the monks is they don't need anything in their lives. So what happens is every uh, every day, twice, uh, once at the beginning of every day, they only eat two meals a day. They eat breakfast crazy early, like six o'clock in the morning, which means they have to go around and collect it at like 5.30, which is why you have to get up at five yes. to, to give them the food. Yeah. But if, if you sleep in the wrong hotel, which I've done, um, you know that they wake up at 3.30 in the morning to start their prayers before that because the wrong hotel has the huge gong next to it. Uh, oh. And I got woken up by them one, yeah, one morning as well. Um, but the, the essentially what it is is the monastery, they pray, they learn. A lot of it's kind of kids from the local towns who aren't going to learn anywhere else in this very poor part of the world. And so the families come out, everyone's family comes out and gives them a little bit of food. So they have a morning meal and then they have a, a lunchtime meal and then they don't eat again the rest of the day. But that's their wants taken care of, right? They've, they've, that's their minimal wants. 
they don't need to strive for anything else in life. That we can't all be like that. that that's impossible. But that, you know, they're getting exactly what they want. They walk around town. It's done for them. And there's this reciprocity that everyone in the town knows that these monasteries are doing good by their kids and doing good by everyone in the town. And so they just they're very, very happy to give them food. And of course, if you're a tourist, you're very happy to do it, too. Um, you know, it's kind of part of the local culture. It, it supposedly within Theravada Buddhism, which is the bit through Thailand in Indochina, it was done in almost every monastery, but it sort of got out of favor and they all stayed in the monasteries. And Luang Prabang is the last town in the world left where they do that. And, you know, as you've seen, hundreds, maybe even thousands of these monks walk past every morning going collecting yeah. food. And it's just, it's a simple life, but it's, it, it works. I was so emotional. As I, I, I couldn't believe how emotional I was getting as I'm as I'm taking my rice and and trying to make sure these people ate. I felt like if I didn't feed yeah. them, they weren't going to eat. And the fact that they wanted for nothing else, I thought was was you know says a lot about consumerism. So let's do that next. Let's talk about these anxieties that we have this this culture because you described that just our culture is anxiety inducing. I mean, we turn on CNBC or Fox business. There's this tape running across the bottom with the letters that don't make words. Like I, I thought about this from somebody that hasn't been doing finances a long time. As I'm reading your words, Michael, I'm thinking about it as somebody who doesn't do that. I turn on this thing. Yeah. I've got these, this tick, I got this tape with these letters that don't say anything, right? These, which, which you and I know are stock symbols, but a new person yeah. doesn't know that, followed by these numbers that seem completely irrelevant with two decimal points. What the hell are they talking about? All of this is so oblique, and you write that this makes us judge ourselves, which is the first thing yeah. I think you caution us against. Yeah, it's right at the beginning of the book because that actually was in, inspired by a group I gave a talk to here in Singapore of people in the creative industries. And I, I realized that they were going to look at me and like, oh, he's a finance guy. What does he know about our lives? And there was going to be a lot of shame and a lack of desire to disclose things. And I wanted to write from the very beginning to say there's no judgment here. And I think it's very important that, that a lot of the difficulty people have with learning finance there are multiple things in it, but one of the starting problems is is judging ourselves and saying, I'm, I'm not good at this. I, I can't do this. I, you know, I have done this really badly in the past and I'm ashamed of it. And we have to let that go because the moment you have shame, the moment you have embarrassment, your brain clogs up and you can't learn new things. And that's why we start the book with that and say, look, you know, I, I've lived in, in Asia 30 years, I can't speak Mandarin, I can't speak Japanese, I can't speak Korean. I speak a smattering of some other languages, but only a bit. Why don't I speak them? Because I was never taught. Uh, these are things I'm not taught. I don't beat myself up about this. I wasn't taught these languages. And there's lots of things that we all don't know how to do that we've not been taught how to do, and we don't beat ourselves up. But the world sets this expectation of us that we should know how to do money, but we've never been taught. And so we feel this guilt that we shouldn't feel because we shouldn't feel guilty about not knowing how to do things that we don't have been taught how to do. And so we need to put that self-judgment aside before we start any program of learning about money and just say, OK, up until now, I've not been very good with money, but that's because I didn't know anything and I'd never been taught. I'm going to start at the beginning and I'm going to learn the basics and I'm going to get the basics down. And if we can say that to ourselves, we've got a chance of really learning and, and, and improving our situation. Well, and there's a, a place where you caution us then right after that, which is, you know, in my life, uh, I see very few of the, the people <clears throat> who truly know money on social media. And it's because a lot of those people, Michael, have compliance departments, lawyers behind them that caution them that you can't say the wrong thing. So they decide to say nothing. Well, that makes social media a yeah. vacuum where you write that, 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 that marketers then step in. Buying at stores makes us want more. So we learn about money through the lens of people marketing for us to, to want more. And in fact, you even write that it used to be stores. Now the store has come to us because it's an app on our phone, <laughs> which consistently yeah, yeah. tells us all the things. <clears throat> There's this vacuum that's being filled by marketers because we refuse to teach each other about the basics. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's and it's. I, I think the scariest thing about this is it's only going to get worse. 
um, because that is a, an industry that's developing. And until we teach people better about money, right from the beginning, from the youngest age, and, and then people who are older, how to deal with their money too, it's only going to get worse because the, the money is getting spent on newer and newer psychologies. I mean, you look at it, we... It, Seven or eight years ago, we were talking about how all the kids were on Facebook all the time, all the kids were on Instagram all the time. And then now it's like they're all on TikTok because TikTok is more addictive. Uh, you know, it's never going backwards. No one's going back to a pen and paper ever again. You know, it's it's only going to get more and more of that. And I think there was, it's, I put it in the book, it's a, it's a survey by Yankelevich, uh, which said that essentially we we see an ad like once every 15 seconds on average. So we're seeing some kind of commercial message once every 15 seconds. Now, it, that sort of sounds a lot, but what's really staggering about that that number is Yankelevich did that survey in 2007 oh oh before, the, you know, before the iPhone. And now with TikToks that we can flip even faster, now we're getting like seven per second. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, and how many times does anyone say, you know what, it's OK to not spend your money today? You, you know what, it's OK. You could actually have more money in the future if you don't do this today. You might hear that once a day tops and you're hearing 20, 30, 40,000 other messages saying you will be cooler. You'll be more attractive. You'll be more successful. You'll be happier if you spend this money. And it's all lies. But those lies, they just build and build and build, and it becomes the de facto education system that we all live in. I'd like to walk through one exercise that you that you take us through that I think our stackers can do as they're hanging out with us. So you have us take out a sheet of paper and write down several of the best things that have ever happened in our life. I think it's six or seven. Just write out six or seven of the best things. So if you want to, stackers, if you want to take part in this, just hit pause right now. Write down six or seven of the the best things that ever happened to you. Uh, what's what what is the point, Michael, of of this exercise of writing down these six or seven things that are the best things that you've ever done? Yeah, it, it's um, it, it, there's a number of things. One of the things I wanted to do with this is with the book is is slow things down. Um, one of the things I wanted to do is to you know with towards mindfulness to, uh, and towards journaling and show the ways that you can journal around happiness and money. But more than that, this came from how angry I got once when someone said to me, I don't want to save money. I want to enjoy myself now. And I was just stunned when I heard it. I was like, you literally just said money equals happy, money equals happy. And I thought this, this happiness is so much more than that. And I was like, okay. So I, I, I remember doing a time. I said, look, I'm going to just sit down. I'm going to write down my happiest times. And, and I, before, before saying what I was doing, why I was doing it, just wrote them down. And some of them, you know, family holidays were expensive. You know, they were on there. You've got to be honest with these things. But there was a bunch of other things which was just like going for a walk in the park. You know, it was the things like, you know, finishing, you know, finishing the training for, for a race. Right. I don't have to do that anymore. That's a happy moment. All these kinds of all, all these tiny little moments that, that aren't expensive because the next part of the exercise for stackers is to sit down and write the most expensive occasions. And, and that's where this becomes interesting, because if they're not exactly the same six or seven occasions, then there's no relationship between money and happiness. Now, I'm not trying to say they're the opposite. I'm not trying to say that everything free is amazing and everything expensive is bad. I'm saying there isn't a relationship. Some expensive things are really worth getting. And some Expensive things are just the worst things. I mean, I, it was, I think it, I put it in the book, right? I think I'd just come from a, not, maybe not long before, for, I'd gone for a very expensive meal that was so expensive, it just made me angry. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I'm never going there again. That's just like, that's, I, I, I'm still getting angry now even thinking about it. I was like, what the hell? Um, and, and it's, yeah, not all expensive things are great. And, and as long as you know that, you can start to optimize for your life. You, and this is how it's just about mindfulness. It's just about thought. 
if I put this thing away, if I don't buy that, if I keep this money, if I do something, if I just go for a walk. I mean, who goes for too many walks, right? I mean, this is there's never occasion where it's just like that's not like just popping out of the office for half an hour and just wandering around doesn't make that day better. That always makes that day better. Totally free. Right. That's a free thing that just made your day better. And that was the exercise to find those little things for you and for anyone that you can just say, yeah, I could throw two or three things of those into my life and it would get better. Didn't cost any money. No relationship. The, the anti-marketing, you know, fighting against the marketing message that spending more equals better in that whole diatribe just blew me away. I want to I want to do one more thing during our time together, which is. Uh, you tell people to take the small path and to build the little wins, which which uh, makes a ton of sense to me. I feel like people get overwhelmed so so uh, quickly in the complexities mm-hmm. of money. So you have a word you came up with, mission, and mission means something completely mm-hmm. different. Can you just walk us through the steps to mission? Yeah. So mission is is an acronym. And I'm one of those people that forget things unless I make them into acronyms. Um, so, it, and that's kind of how this came around. Uh, and really, there's there's six steps to mission. Um, so I put together M is for money, uh, and this is I should also explain this came from working with my daughter on this because I wanted her to start at the very 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 beginning. If you we all think we know what money is. But because we don't really, we mess up. It's not a lot of the things we think it is. So I want to start with that very, very basic of what is money. And then when we know what money is and we know why we want to get it into our lives, then we have to understand how we get it into lives. So I is for income. So it's, we, we have to get that income. The next thing is saving, because that's the first thing you do with income. It's not spending. Spending comes next. You always save first. You never spend first. Uh, my, my favorite version of this is actually that the people say, well, I can save at the end of the month. It's like, no, no, that's money you accidentally didn't spend. That's not saving as an action. Right. <laughs> that's so true. Right? <laughs> save it at the beginning of the month. If you accidentally didn't spend it all that you got left, you could add that to your savings, but that's still <laughs> accidental non-spending. <laughs> It's the beginning of the month is when you yeah, say high five yourself for the <laughs> yeah. high five yourself for that. But that's not saving. Yeah. It's not saving. So so saving comes first, then spending, because spending, we've got to work out how to budget. So we do that. And then we got another eye, which is for investing, because this is what we do with those savings. This is how we we turn these things around. But I don't think you can be talking about investing until you've understood what money is and what income is and what saving is. And then the the, the last letter of the ac- acronym is O. Which you know, I know it sounds odd because it doesn't. It's not O, but it's O, because that's owning, and that's what we want to do. We want to own. That's what investing is. Investing is a process towards ownership. That's how you don't confuse it with speculation or gambling, because speculation and gambling is just things going up and down. But you want to build ownership of something, you invest. And so we had that, and I had this wonderful acronym of MISSIO, um, so which is rubbish, right? <laughs> um, and then. Ooh, okay, we've got it. If I tag an N on the end, um, we have mission. The mission then it actually gets. N the, is my favorite, though. It's your favorite, right? N yeah. is my favorite. Because it only. Yeah, go ahead. Because it Keep only. Going. It only starts one time. Then, you know, we, then we come back to Zen again, right? There is only one time, and that time is now. You don't start tomorrow. You don't start in a week, and you don't beat yourself up for not starting last week. There is only now. There is only the present, and so that. Great. That's that has that's how we got the acronym mission, and what I liked about that is that gave me, as I said earlier on, the milestones, the bigger landmarks are on this path that we need to walk because we're going from, do we even understand money? Do we have any income? Do we have any savings? Are we investing? Are we owning now? And and what are we doing? And then that's the eventual goal where we actually have ownership of our lives. I like the N on the end for this simple reason. We we actually got a call into our show a couple weeks ago from a guy who's a super saver, Michael. And and I, I feel like there's two ends of the spectrum in our in our stacker mm-hmm. community. There's people trying to get started and trying to fight through fear to get moving. And then you have the Uber savers that are so busy accumulating they can't make themselves live in the now. Yeah. 
And this is, I think, important that once you've done the Missy O, Mm -hmm. you've done all that, you can forget about everything. You're fine, and now you can live today with the rest of your money. You don't have to worry about it at all. I love that. I love that because it's, I, you know, we, you know, you mentioned earlier on about fire and we talk about financial. I like the term financial freedom. Um, and sometimes people would say, well, yeah, isn't that old money obsessed? And I think, I think you're missing the point. It's freedom from finances. It's not freedom from anything else. Like, you know, it's like your family worries are still going to be there. You know, you, maybe your work worries might still be there if you want to carry on working. Your ego worries, your status worries, your health worries, they're all still going to be there. You only don't have financial worries because you're financially free. So it's not about the money at all. It's literally about getting the money out of the equation. So 100% right. Get it out of the equation. Understand where you are. But that's that's where the, I mean, for me, you know, on with the book, as important as the title is a subtitle because a simple path because this is a path we all and we and one of the reasons so many people get confused by financial information that they see is it's meant for someone at a different point on a different path you know so i might you know i might turn on the tv and it might be talking about mortgage rates but i'm just beginning to save and i'm thinking oh my the deposit on a house the down payment is so huge who the hell can worry about mortgage rates or they hear about something else or you hear about something else not all information is for everyone but if you can start at the beginning of your path and then take small steps then you know when the information is relevant for you and you know when it's not and that i think is one of the most important parts to to having the mission there those big signposts to 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 be the bits in between you know that you can see from the small steps uh, we've all seen the little book uh, series from Wiley. This is the little book of Zen Money, a simple path to financial peace of mind. Michael, I think it's available everywhere, correct? It is, yeah. I mean, that's the great thing about Wiley, right? I mean, it, it's such a, I have to say, it's such an honor um, when Wiley suggested that they would like me to write a little book. And I was like, are you talking about the same series that Jack Bogle wrote one? Uh, and and Damodaran, are okay. uh, you like a seven dollar millionaire one? I think okay. You know, there's no way I say no to this, and now I just have to work out. You know, the, the right. book that, that would work. And it was actually it was because it was called the little book that it came up. It's the little book of Zen money sounded like the right thing as well. So that was one of the, the reasons that led to it was because it is called the little book. Well, thank you for helping so many of our stackers today get a little bit more Zen about their money. I super appreciate it. That's my pleasure. Love doing it. And, and yeah, congratulations on all the work you do helping those people too. Huge thanks to Michael Gilmore. I love that simple equation, OG. It's the things you get versus the things that you want. And I love the fact that he realized early on that infinite happiness means not wanting anything. If you find that you can lower that number, and of course, that number is not something we're always going to achieve. But, uh, but I do think yeah. Zen and minimalism, I'm with them. I think Zen and minimalism have, have a lot to do with each other. Make your wants like lower. The books, on, book, book, books on my desk right here. It's coming with me to the, on summer vacation, the probably third or fourth time that I'll read through Essentialism, which I think is a really good book by uh, Greg McCune. Yeah. About being, being happy happy now with what you, with what you have. Hey, let's, uh, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, OG, they put what you value first. It can't be golf for uh, the 67th time. Please, no. No, no, no. Or just uh, trying to, you know, trying to finish up summer stuff here. That's all we're trying to do, which includes golfing. Hey, see what I did there? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, nope. Some of life's most important questions are how do we navigate your and my calendar to actually record episodes? That's one of life's most important uh, questions right now. That will be a challenge. If you, if you can, if you can make that happen, we've got a job for you. (laughs) Joe, you must be terrified of what my possible answers are to the Haven lifeline value question, because you've asked OG now like six episodes in a row. You just don't want to hear from me and you're, you're willing to put up with him saying golf every damn time just because you don't want to hear what I have to say. I keep thinking we're going to get something else. That we're, we might get a different one. Why, yeah. did you have something else? You got one ready? No. Doug. No, of course I don't. Because I know you're so, not even going to ask me anymore, so I don't even bother prepping. Doug, what is the most important thing to you, Doug? Hearing the rest of this Haven Lifeline pitch. Let's go. Move on with it, ad boy. It's, it's, 
The things you love are your loved ones and your time. It's why they made buying quality term life insurance, Doug, actually simple. You go to stackingbenjamins.com lovingly and with no anger in your voice slash Haven Life, and you'll get a free quote. Love what they're doing at Haven Life now because they're committed to offering a modern way to buy life insurance. Their application is simple. It's online. Get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable, Doug, and lovely customer support. Lovely. Stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life. Get your life insurance done, people. Let's get it done. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to our friend Tracy. Hey, Tracy. Hey, guys. It's Tracy from Chicago. I um, was wondering if you could talk about Roth 401ks and in what situations would they be beneficial over a traditional 401k? Me and my husband are in our 40s. I have a pension. He has a 401k that he contributes to and gets an employer match. We both max out our Roth IRAs. We're probably in the 22% tax bracket. And his employer now offers a Roth 401k. And we weren't sure how to know if it's a good idea to put it in a Roth 401k or the 401k or a combination of both. And you can give my t-shirt to Doug because I already have mine from a long time ago. Hopefully, my extra small size will fit him. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye. Can you imagine how awesome my pecs are going to look in that shirt? Tracy, Doug, as you know, Doug loves the shorty short. So he, he loves the shirt that looks like a half shirt. But uh, I don't think we can. I don't think mom will allow that in the basement. Oh, gee. I don't think, uh, I think mom would have something to say about that. It's against the dress code, Doug. It's against the dress code. So we got to wait for somebody who's maybe the XXXXXL that you are. Hey, 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 (laughs) hey. Why you got to lash out at me like that? Whoa. (laughs) That escalated quickly. Wow. It was just sitting there. It was sitting there and I, I apologize. That was, that was not great. But I think that might be Tracy, by the way, and uh, I think this might be Tracy that helped us set up our Aurora event. You guys remember Tracy? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, she was awesome. Yeah. Big help. Great I think event. That's, I think that's a Tracy, but let's be awesome to Tracy. What do you think about the Roth 401k OG? Who's this right for? I always love this question because, you know, what we're trying to do is solve a tax problem today without knowing all the details in the future, right? And when are we going to know whether or not putting money away at today's tax rate is better than taking it out at tomorrow's tax rate? And when we get to know that information is when we take the money out at tomorrow's tax rate. (laughs) It may be lower or it may be higher. And and that's going to give you the answer to, was it better to put it in my pre-tax or my Roth 401k. The right answer, I think, is probably to make sure that you have an equal balance between all of the different types of accounts, accounts that you have that are going to have taxes assigned to them. So you get some tax deductions today, but uh, but grow tax deferred and, and, and you pay a little taxes on the back end. Some money that's tax deferred today, but you've already paid taxes on it and you get tax free on the back end. And then a combo, your regular brokerage account where you kind of pay taxes as you go. Because we don't know what the tax brackets, we don't know what the tax rules are going to be, you know, in 25 years from now when you're taking money out of your retirement accounts. So why not have the opportunity to have the most flexibility? That being said, if you're putting a, you know, if you're putting a gun to my head and saying, but I need an answer now, I come down on the same side as Ed Slot. If you have the opportunity to pay the taxes today, if you can save the amount of money that you need to save for your for your retirement plans and you can pay the taxes today and not have to worry about uh, any taxes ever again, asterisk, assuming that the government doesn't change their mind. I like the Roth 401k because it's completely tax free from here on out. I think an interesting point that you make, OG, is is different than people will often hear which is people are solving for optimization. Tracy and her husband might be solving to optimize their tax situation. And you're solving for something different. You're solving for flexibility. And it's partly because we don't know the future that we truly can't solve for optimization. It's hard to optimize something when you don't know what's going to happen in the future. So giving yourself access to all the different options, I think, uh, I think, um, 
is is uh, where you're going with this? Yeah, flexibility wins. We have Tracy. We have this in in a uh, quick PDF form because we've talked about it so much. It's stackybenjamins.com slash tax triangle for people that want to see the different sides of of the tax triangle. There's there's the three areas that OG talked about, and we have this in a very simple graphic that we use. So you can dive into it. You'll see that we've got the Roth IRA slash 401k uh, at the top, and then one of the sides has the traditional 401k. And often what people will try to do is make sure they have some in all those pots. So I think looking and seeing how much money you have in each one of those is also a nice place to start. Stackybenjamins.com slash tax triangle for that, uh, for that resource. Thanks for the question, Tracy. And uh, Doug, although you don't get a t-shirt, that was, it was very nice that she, uh, that she was just trying to help the man. That's cool. Appreciate the thought, Tracy. Thank you. Yes. Good, good work, Tracy. And, and great hearing your voice. Uh, hey, let's talk about the community calendar for a moment. I just got to say a big thank you to the people at uh, Farm Credit for having me be their keynote speaker at their event this last week. OG and Doug, I got to talk to some young farmers, a bunch of farmers all under 35 years old. And if you're new to our audience because you were there, glad, glad that you're with us. But I got to tell you, I got to hang out with some of these people and the future of farming in America looks <laughs> looks pretty bright. These people, the questions that they asked and their interest in uh, financial planning, really super exciting. It was it was a great group. I think that what a lot of people don't know who aren't from the heartland, who haven't spent a lot of time out in rural America, is that farmers are business people. And it's a very yeah. complex business. It's actually very complex. And there's nothing simple about running the business of a farm. And I totally understand why not only are they interested in personal finance, but just finance in general. I get it. Farm Credit was putting them through all kinds of breakouts about secession planning. You know, you got this multi-million dollar operation, to your point, Doug. Like, who's going to, how do you make sure that the next generation takes it over? The people you want to have take it over. Like, that's a... That's a big thing. And OG, as you know, that's some pretty complex estate planning for, for these people. And then also how to evaluate real estate, different real estate decisions. I sat in on one of those pieces, of course, looking at some of the accounting stuff that they used. And then my job was to help bring it together at the end with some good personal finance. So thanks to Farm Credit for having me. Thanks to all the farmers that were there. It was super, super fun. Speaking of fun, we got some fun happening on our Instagram live this week on Thursday. Christina Roman from Experian OG is going to join me. I don't mean from Experian OG. There is no company called Experian OG. It's Experian comma OG. Although you could merge with Experian. You ever think about that, OG? You could uh, maybe merge uh, the business together. A compelling pitch. I mean, I might think about it. Um, you know, so I could, I I just could acquire their firm. Yeah. Yeah. Cash, all cash deal. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask Christine. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask Christina about that. I love talking uh, to people like Christina because there's so much that we don't understand about our credit. We don't understand how it works. We have all these assumptions. So Christina Roman joining us uh, on Instagram. That's what's happening here. If you want to know all the places you can interface with us, com slash welcome gives you our complete welcome guide and all the different channels. We talked about our YouTube page earlier. We're uh, just getting into TikTok, trying to get Doug to dance, and we haven't been able to get that going yet, but wait, maybe maybe soon we'll get uh, Doug. Hold on, are you kidding me? They named an entire dance after my dance. The Doug? Yeah, the Dougie, yeah. I mean, don't even know. OG, I had Justin you know Verlander's wife doing it. I mean, I think I think I've got the dancing covered. Nobody's doubting my dance moves. You can tell you can tell G when somebody's a baseball fan because they call her Justin Verlander's wife. <laughs> I don't know what her name is. Are you, t- are you talking about Kate? <laughs> Kate Upton. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yes. They don't even call, Mrs. OG doesn't go by Mrs. OG. Like she just doesn't want to be doesn't want to be known that way. No. It's uh Ms. Upton to you. Where, where are I'm we sure at? she's mad some accomplishments just, of her own. I think we just ran, ran this trade right off the, where are we going? I know where we're going. If you don't want to be in the weeds like I am right now, wondering what the next sentence is in your financial plan, you know what it should be? It should be, I need to make better financial decisions. 
How about that? And if I'm going to do that, I need great people in my corner. OG and his team are taking clients. So to get on their calendar, you go to stackybenjamins.com slash OG. That is the link that gets you rolling to making sure we're already halfway through the year. Have you started working on your goals this year? If not, maybe, maybe you need somebody to give you a little bit of a nudge. Stackybenjamins.com slash OG. That's it for today. Coming up on Wednesday, a special episode. The first person who won two awards from Michael Gilmore's awards, the MIAM awards. We're going to talk to Bixie creator Rosalia Gatal in an extended interview. This is, this was, we spent, we had so much fun talking to Rosalia as you guys know, if you've been here a while, we normally talk to people for about 20, 25 minutes. Her story is so compelling and she had so many setbacks and made so many great moves from being an orphan to living abroad to creating some brand new fintech because of her passion to help people do better with their money. We're going to talk about all those things that's coming up on Wednesday. But coming up right now, we went through a lot today. Doug, why don't you help us distill it to uh, three? What should we have learned today? Well, Joe first, take some advice from Michael Gilmore and practice the art of getting zen with your money. Second, take some advice from our TikTok and keep a close eye on strippers to stay in tune with the economy. It's research. But the big lesson, sometimes your intuition isn't right. It looks like Joe's mom's making tuna sandwiches for lunch. Hard pass. Thanks to Michael Gilmore for joining us today. You can purchase his book, The Little Book of Zen Money, wherever you find the finer books. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. You know, Joe, this part of the credits is so important to me, I had to go put on my favorite shirt. Let's do this. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihat. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Joe Salcihai with help from me, Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast, and Lacey Langford from the Military Money Show. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. got to tell you guys especially og uh i think you will in well this will resonate with you from your time as a pilot uh so yesterday cheryl texts me that there are uh tons of storms rolling through texarkana and so that last leg of my trip which can be difficult a lot from Dallas to Texarkana in the much smaller jet. Uh, There have been several times that that gets canceled for many different reasons. I don't know what all the reasons are, but that flight gets canceled a lot. But this time it's for a very good reason that there's storms there. But I'm sitting in Nashville waiting on my earlier flight and and I keep watching weather.com And where there was going to be solid thunderstorms around midnight when my plane came in, all of a sudden there's this break like a field goal for two hours where there's not going to be any storms. And I told Cheryl, I'm like, hey, this looks this looks pretty. This looks great. 
And in fact, my flight was on time. I get to Dallas. My flight is on time. My flight loads on time. Everybody gets into the plane and the captain comes on and he says, right now there are some severe thunderstorms right over where we're headed in Texarkana. But the good news is they've been heading off to the east. And just like weather.com said, by the time we get there in about 35 minutes, they're going to be off to the east and we're going to be able to get in there. And so we take off last night. Everything's going great. We get almost all the way to Texarkana and the, uh, and the pilot comes on and says, hey, bad news. Remember how those storms were just moving along? Well, they have stopped right on top of the airport we need to get into. And this whole idea that the storms are just going to keep moving didn't happen. He goes, but the good news is we've got enough gas to just stay up here for an hour. We got enough fuel. So we're just going to kind of hang out. And so, oh, gee, we saw the best light show last night. Just this, it was, it was just constant lightning in the clouds, just constant lightning in the clouds as we kept kind of circling back and forth along this, along this front end. I got to imagine sometimes when you're flying, cause you've, you've flown quite a few times around thunderstorms. You must get some beautiful, beautiful views. Yeah. As long as you're a safe distance there, uh, it looks pretty yeah. cool when, 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 when it's, when, when it's inside of 30 or 40 miles, you're like, that is pretty close. <laughs> that looks like <laughs> that could, that could touch me. I don't want that. Well, they, they seem to be very respectful. These pilots. It's hard to, it's hard to fly storm. at night with thunderstorms because of the, uh, you know, cause you can get into them and you don't even know that they're there. You know what I mean? Like it's hard to, oh. or the weather, if, if weather pattern kind of develops and, around you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can, if you, you know, you can see a tall cloud that's lightning, you know, whatever off in the distance, that's fine. But if it's a, if it's a day like yesterday, it would have been a pretty difficult, pretty difficult thing to sit there and, and fly around in, even if you were safe. Well, so the first, so about, yeah, Doug. Well, I, I was, I, I didn't even think you were in the air in Tar- Texarkana last night. Cause I thought you said that you had to get a room in Dallas. So is there more to this story? Well, yeah, we were, we were 90% of the way there and we tooled around for a long time. Um, which is why OG, uh, uh, I didn't call you last night. Cause by the time I got back, it was really late, but, but, uh, about 30 minutes in the guy said, well, it's not looking all that great. We're going to hang out a little bit longer. We probably hang out about another 15 or 20 minutes. And then we're just going to have to go back to Dallas because there's no way we're just, not going to, I just pulled your gonna, flight up on, uh, on flight aware. So I can, I'm, I'm watching it where you can, I can see all the laps do, you did. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to do anything. You know, uh, we're not going to try to be brave and get in there. And I'm like, that's good. That's fine. Um, but I certainly would like to go home tonight. I certainly would love to do that. And then uh, that little bell ring, ding, 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 that, you know, a lot of times I think is, is like people pushing the button, but I'm sitting in row one and I hear the flight attendant go, oh, that's not good. I think we're going back to Dallas. And she gets on the phone. She goes, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. And then she goes, hey, good news, everybody. That, that, that storm that was over Texarkana has separated and there's a little sliver and we are going in. So the pilots tell me it's going to be a little bumpy and, uh, and, and we're going to, we're going to go. So we should be on the ground in about 15 minutes. The second we start descending, oh gee, I was sure I was going to die. I wish it, it, it wasn't a little bumpy. It was horrible. I think I've been on one flight my entire life that was more bumpy than this flight. It just, the whole damn plane is shaking like hell. It was just, it was nasty. And we probably endured that, you know, it felt like for about seven hours, but I I would say it was closer to maybe three and a half minutes when, 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 when all of a sudden, uh, uh, I hear the engines just kick in and hear like just all of a sudden we got tons of power and the guy behind me goes, yep, we're done trying this. And, and, And sure enough, we, uh, we turned around and the pilot comes on, he's like, Guys, I, I tried, but I'm not going to go into unsafe conditions. And that was getting unsafe in a hurry. So we're going back to Dallas. 
And uh, good on American Airlines, who I bust on a ton for being so crappy, especially in Dallas. When I was in Detroit, the, the people with American Airlines were amazing. In Dallas, I always felt like morale was very low and they were just it was it was not a great organization. They took care of us last night. Like everybody was super the guy waved the whole, you know, if it's an act of God, they don't have to put you up at a hotel. They don't have to give you a food voucher. They don't have to uh, uh, taxi. They did the whole thing. They, they sprang for, for everything. And they were super, just super helpful. So the people at American Airlines, fantastic. By the way, there wasn't one person because I was in a taxi with one of these uh, van taxis going to the Best Western, this resort they put us up at called the Best Western. There wasn't one. Yeah, there wasn't one. They really did treat you right. Do you know who I am? Right. There wasn't one person, by the way, that I talked to either last night or this morning that was like, "Oh, I wish we would have kept going for it." Everybody was like, "I'm so happy we turned around." (laughs) I'm so, 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 so happy we turned around because oh my, oh my goodness, that was tough.